Thank you, Julie. Great introduction. Hi, everyone. Are you having fun at the conference yet? Hi, everyone. Are you having fun at the conference yet? Yeah. Imagine for a moment that you are living in a world where 70% of the food that is being grown in the world is being grown by small-scale farmers using only 30% of the total energy input that is used in agriculture. Would you like to live in a world like that? Well, congratulations. You already do. That is the data that's provided by the um, FAO on current global food production. 70% of the total production, total global food supply is grown by small-scale growers, and that 70% of production on small-scale farms is utilizing only 30% of the energy input. Do you know what that means? That means that the remaining 30% of the food supply that is being grown by industrial-scale agriculture is consuming 70% of the total energy input. Imagine for a moment living in a world where there is a fleet of autonomous vehicles that is able to pick up food from a farmer and deliver it directly to the consumers with no uh, third party interface, not going through grocery stores, not going through markets, going, going directly from the grower to the consumer. Imagine living in a world where you have a universal basic income, where the extension of universal basic income means that not only do you have a universal basic income, that means you also have the opportunity for a lot of young people who have a desire to become more engaged with agriculture to begin producing food. Imagine a world where all the farming that is being conducted, both on a small scale and a large scale, is what we today would desire to define as regenerative farming. Would you like to live in a world like that? That's the world that is coming, and that's a world that is coming really, really fast. I believe that each of those thing, three things that I mentioned, and I could go on and add a lot more to the list, but I believe that each of those three things that I mentioned is going to happen perhaps much faster than we might think. Uh, it could be within the next 10 years, could be within the next 20 years, but it will happen within our lifetime. And I believe my personal mission, what I'm really passionate about, is having regenerative models of agriculture become the mainstream, become the status quo globally around the world by 2040. And that's a very achievable mission. That's something that we can accomplish. So today, there are a lot of discussions today about sustainability in agriculture and the desire to have a, uh, to have a sustainable agriculture. And my perspective is that First of all, we cannot have a sustainable agriculture today at our current level of production, nor should we desire to sustain where we are today. We have a system where our agricultural ecosystems, we have incredibly degraded soils, we have unhealthy soils, we have plants that are susceptible to disease and insect pests, and we are producing food that is extremely unhealthy for us by and large. Why would we desire to sustain that model? We, f we first need to have a conversation about developing regenerative agriculture ecosystems. And in, in this context, what I'm personally really passionate about and the way that I think about regenerative agriculture ecosystems are systems which are constantly regenerating soil health where we're rapidly sequestering carbon, building soil organic matter, and increasing soil microbiology, which then leads to much healthier plants that have a functional immune system and are capable of resisting disease and insect pests. And not only do they have a functional immunity, but they're also able to transfer that immunity to the people who consume that food and we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. This is moving beyond a conversation about food biofortification, but actually having a discussion around how we can increase a plant's immune system and phytonutrient concentrations so that we can increase the people's immune systems who consume that food. When I think about regenerative agriculture ecosystems, I think about the experiences that we've had with advancing eco-agriculture in the last decade. And I believe that regenerative agriculture ecosystems are more, they're about more than just soil health. They're about more than improving plant health. And they're even about more than growing food as medicine. I believe fundamentally that we are producing crops. So we have come to accept as normal, as common. We don't actually even know what healthy plants look like anymore. 
Not only do we know, not know what healthy plants look like anymore, we also don't know what high yielding plants look like that are actually achieving a greater proportion of their genetic potential. In 1978, there was a researcher at University of Iowa, or Iowa State University, it was a team of, uh, a multi-university team was evaluating corn yields and seeking how they could increase yield potential. And Charles Tsai at the Iowa State University calculated that at that time, 1977, all the corn genetics available in the marketplace at that moment in time had the epigenetic potential and the biochemical potential to produce 1,100 bushels per acre. Wait, what? Today, our national average is 155 bushels per acre here in North America. So, what I realized in the study and the research looking at Charles Tsai's work and looking at other people's work was that we are routinely harvesting in the neighborhood of about 15 to 20 percent of our crops inherent genetic potential. We can produce substantially greater yields of the exact same crops on the same soils than we are producing right now and then what we've come to accept as normal. And I think as these crops begin showing us what they're really capable of, we should, prepared, we should be prepared to be surprised. In 2011, we worked with an organic green bean grower and growing green beans in coastal Washington for processing 1,100 acres on relatively dry, sandy soils that were being irrigated. And this farmer called us out of desperation in February just before the growing season was about to begin. He said that for the last, I've been growing organically certified green beans for the last four years for this processor, and my average yield has been 4.2 tons per acre in each of those four years. My processor called me and they said, we're not able to find enough organic acres. We can't find enough organic acres for all the market demand of organic green beans. We need you to produce a minimum of five and a half tons per acre. And I don't know how to do that. We work with that grower. Uh, we put together a nutritional and biological application program that we put on nutrient and biological applications at planting, followed up with three foliar applications. When the combines and the harvesters rolled into the first field, the yield monitors reported that they were harvesting 11 and a half tons per acre. For the entire growing season, the entire 1,100 acres, the grower averaged 10.5 tons across all 1,100 acres. From a prior four-year yield average of 4.2 tons to 10 and a half tons, more than doubled the overall yields. That is what plants are really capable of. That's what the plants that we are growing today in our gardens are really capable of. Not just green beans, but tomatoes and strawberries and raspberries and blueberries and blackberries and all the crops that we are growing. What I found really intriguing was that not only did we get this exceptionally high yield response, but that, first of all, the yield response was not driven with fertilizers because this was an organic certified farm. We were not putting on large quantities of compost or liquid fish or other fertilizers that were being applied. And historically, this farmer had a chronic challenge with white mold. Uh, even though it was a relatively low rainfall environment, they would still get a lot of morning fog, lots of humidity in the air, and it was very common to have problems with white mold. But their high yielding crop in 2011 did not have any white mold. Those plants were healthy enough that they were able to be completely resistant to diseases. In 2016, we started working with a farmer in the Central Valley of California who was growing a variety of different stone fruit, peaches, nectarines, uh, plums, etc., also grapes and some other crops. We started working on some of his nectarine blocks. And starting with a fall application of nutrients and biologicals in the fall, and then uh, four foliar applications the following spring increased the marketable yield, the marketable fruit that he was actually able to ship and sell on the marketplace by a factor of 40% in one year. So it's possible to have plants that are producing much higher yields and higher quality than we have come to expect. And oh, by the way, not only were they producing a 40% yield increase, but bacterial canker disappeared. Brown rot disappeared. 
And they were able to store the fruit in the cooler before shipping it for six weeks instead of for four. So all of that lends to increased storability and less food waste. Do you know that today, we live in a world right now where we grow enough food globally. There's, there's, there's all these conversations about needing to f be able to feed a growing world population, that we're going to have 9 billion people to feed by 2050, et cetera, et cetera. And there's obviously a lot of dialogue and a lot of debate around some of those numbers. But you know, according to the Wagoner Report and several other reports that have been published, we grow enough food right now, today, to feed 12 billion people. Right now. We don't need to grow any more food. We simply need to stop wasting all the food that we're producing and we need to distribute it equitably. So we have a distribution problem and we have a waste problem. We don't necessarily have an agricultural production problem. However, I would also suggest that we need to begin producing food a little bit differently. Let's, do you know that of, of all the hundreds of millions of acres of corn production that is being grown in North America today, somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of it is being utilized for ethanol production? which is a really stupid idea. Uh, imagine what would happen if, imagine what would happen if we began actually producing food crops that people consumed on all of those acres. Or better, if we started grazing all those acres with grass-fed beef production. Do you know that today in the Midwest, it's possible for farmers to begin producing 100% grass-fed beef and make more money and be more profitable than they are growing corn? That's been true every year for the last seven years. And it will continue to be true, I believe, for, for the foreseeable future because of what is happening with corn marketplaces. So another example, another story that I think of is a farmer that we've been working with for a number of years in southwest Kansas, Brad Kane. We first started working with him in 2011. And in the first year, he was growing both conventional and organic corn and soybeans and food grade dry beans, milo and millet and wheat, etc. And the first year, growing dry land corn that was non irrigated, we had very good rainfall that year in that region, about 27 inches. In mid July, towards the end of July, Brad called us and he said, hey, I have a problem. I have spider mites on my corn crop. And it's organically certified. I can't spray a miticide. How do I manage it? We made a recommendation for Brad on a specific uh, nutritional foliar application to be applied to his corn. And two days later, 48 hours later, he called back. He was in the field with his crop scout. And he says, I, I don't understand. The spider mites are dead. What happened to the spider mites? Not only were the spider mites gone, but that corn crop had no corn earworm. The corn earworm was completely gone. They harvested 304 bushels per acre of certified organic corn that was dry land, where the regional averages for irrigated corn are 280 bushels per acre. And as if though that were not enough, we documented a gain of organic matter in the soil profile of three quarters of a percentage point in a 12 month growing season. Wow. On that same field, as an experiment, we planted that same field into corn year after year for three years and we, we gained an average of a half a percentage point of organic matter each year for three consecutive years for a total organic matter gain of one and a half percent. Can you imagine the quantity of carbon sequestration that needed to happen in order to make that happen? One of the foundational ideas that has crept into the agricultural mindset is that agriculture is somehow, by its very nature, inherently extractive, that we are extracting nutrients and that we're extracting uh, minerals and carbon and organic matter from the soil profile. And that can be true if we manage it that way. But in, if we look at relatively recent agricultural history in the 1960s and 1970s, it was the common, the mainstream knowledge at that moment in history was that the fastest way to build organic matter was to grow corn. And today, if you look back at all the old agronomy journals, of which I've read many of the old agronomy textbooks, Don Schrieffer wrote about this in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, the common perception was that the fastest way to build organic matter was to grow a corn crop. And today, we have the idea that the fastest way to lose organic matter is to grow a corn crop. So what's changed? 
What is different today than was what was happening in the 60s and 70s? And what has changed? There's obviously a number of different factors that has changed, but the fundamental differences are that we've changed the way we manage the crop. We've, not, we've changed the type of crop that we're growing with genetic modification, et cetera. We've changed how it impacts the soil microbiology. But most importantly of all, we have changed the soil's capacity to release carbon dioxide and the plant's capacity to photosynthesize. I think all of this Bring, brought about for me and my pathway, it brought about a fundamental realization that there is this entire conversation today, particularly in the domain of biological and organic agriculture, that we need to have a healthy soil to grow a healthy plant. And that's true. We do. We do need to work to improve our soil health. However, the pathway to building really healthy soils is to grow exceptionally healthy plants. It was healthy, it's healthy plants that sequester carbon and build organic matter and improve soil health, not the other way around. Plant, soil health is not the engine that drives plant health, it's actually plant health and photosynthesis that is the engine that drives soil health. Plants through photosynthesis are the only engine, they're the only way you have of bringing new energy into the ecosystem. They bring in new energy from sunlight and solar collection. In 2009, we were working with an organic farmer in central Pennsylvania who called us about three weeks after his corn had emerged. And he said, I have a problem. I have wireworms and corn rootworm throughout my entire corn crop. It's consuming about 50% of my plants. Uh, it's too late for me to replant. And obviously, I can't spray an insecticide. What can I do to manage this corn crop? So we again made recommendations for a nutritional foliar. And remember, this nutritional foliar, we're talking about corn rootworm that are present in the root system. They're not, they were not being contacted by the foliar spray. And uh, my comment was, I don't know if, it's, if we're actually going to be able to impact what is happening in the root system or not. I think that we will, but we don't have any prior experience doing this. I don't actually know if it's going to work or not. So I made a rec we made a recommendation for a nutritional foliar application, which he applied, and 48 hours later, uh, they were searching the soils with magnifying glasses and found dead corn rootworm and dead wireworm. And the crop, snapped, the crop snapped out of it completely and they were able to produce a complete harvest. I share these as examples as examples of what I believe a regenerative agriculture can be and what a regenerative agriculture should become. In my, my own personal story, my pathway of what has brought me here I grew up on a family fruit and vegetable farm in Northeast Ohio in the snow belt south of Lake Erie, about an hour east of Cleveland, halfway between Cleveland and the Pennsylvania border. In the early 2000s, uh, when, I, when I graduated from school, I was, um, grew up in an Amish community. I'm still a part of that Amish community today. In, when I graduated from school at the age of 14, I was given the responsibility of doing all the drip irrigation and foliar applications of fertilizers and pesticides. We were very intense pesticide users at this point. In fact, my father was the pesticide distributor for the local region. We were the first people to try all the newest, latest, and greatest and hottest cocktails. I was a licensed pesticide applicator when I was 16 years old. So I know what it's like to come from, to come from the other side and to come from the other perspective. But in, two th in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003, and 4, we had a three-year consecutive period in which we lost greater than 70% of all the crops that we were growing. We were producing, at this point, our four primary crops were um, tomatoes, cucumbers, zucchini, and cantaloupe. And three consecutive years, we lost over 70% to a variety of different diseases and insects that we were unsuccessful in managing and controlling with pesticide applications. In 2004, the third year of that three-year period, we began renting a field from a neighboring farm that bordered right up against one of our own fields. So there used to be these, long, these two fields which were long, narrow strips. And because they were quite narrow, they were being tilled and planted up and down the slope, which is not an awesome idea. Now that we were farming both fields, the field that we had started renting had been on a former Amish dairy farm. So it was a um, corn, small grains, and two years of alfalfa rotation. So it was a very soil friendly rotation with manure applications and limestone applications in very minimal herbicide and pesticide applications. Where in the soil that we had been farming for the last decade, we, had, we were growing cover crops every year during the winter months but we were growing vegetables on the same soil year after year after year with very intense pesticide applications. So in 
2004, now that we were farming both fields, we switched the direction that the fields were being tilled and planted. We started planting crops across the field border. We planted, this, and of course, this field was right beside the highway where everybody could see it driving by. At har we planted this field into cantaloupe. At harvest time, the old soil that had had the intense pesticide exposure, 80% of the cantaloupe leaves were infected with powdery mildew. On the new soil, there was no powdery mildew. Not 5% leaf infection or 10% leaf infection. There was zero. You couldn't find any. There was this knife line right down through the center of the field with powdery mildew on one side and no powdery mildew on the other. In fact, it was so pronounced that there were healthy vines growing right in amongst the unhealthy vines on the field border. And that was the real light bulb moment for me. I wanted to know what are the differences between these two plants and what allows one plant to be resistant to powdery mildew when the next plant two feet away is susceptible. It's the same variety. It was planted the same day. Uh, it has the same nutrient applications. You would think it would be growing on the same soil, so what is the difference? That question inspired years of research and study and speaking to many people in, who are studying plant health and plant immunity from all over the world. And what I learned very simply is that plants have an immune system exactly the same way that we do. We understand that all of us have our own immune systems, but our immune systems don't all work equally well. Some people become ill with the first cold or flu bug that comes along, and other people practically never become ill. And the only difference between these two is how well their immune system has been supported with nutrition over the course of their entire lifetime. In fact, from even before they were born. And the same concept also holds true for plants. This led to, eventually, at the encouragement of my father and some of the mentors that I was working with, led to the founding of Advancing Eco-Agriculture. And our initial claim to fame, the work that we started doing with farmers, was helping them manage nutrition in such a manner that they could grow crops which were completely resistant to diseases and completely resistant to insect pests. As we started this work, I quickly came to realize that not only were we growing crops that were resistant to diseases and insects, but these were crops which had very high content of phytonutrients, sometimes called plant secondary metabolites. These are the foundation of a plant's immune system. So we sometimes speak about phytoalexins or terpenoids or sesquiterpenes, bioflavonoids. These are all medicinal compounds that plants produce. In plain English, we call them essential oils. All crops produce essential oils. And all of these essential oils, these phytoalexins and phytonutrients that plants produce, they produce as plant protectants to protect themselves from ultraviolet radiation, from insect attack, from disease attack, from overgrazing, etc. And these compounds have antifungal, antibacterial, and antiviral properties. They are incredibly effective, and they will kill any insect or any pathogen that attempts to invade the plant. But wait, not only do they have this effect on plant immunity, but think about some of the compounds that we now understand to enhance our own immunity as well, such as resveratrol, or lycopene in tomatoes, or anthocyanins in blueberries. All of these compounds that I just mentioned are plant secondary metabolites. They're the foundation of plant immunity. And not only do they, are they the foundation of a plant's immune system, we now understand that they also enhance our own immune system as well. So I became really inspired by the idea that we could grow plants that were so healthy that we could have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. But then we had another experience which really caught my attention. We're, we were conducting trials to evaluate and to demonstrate what we could do by managing plant nutrition on strawberry production in California. And to give you a little bit of context, strawberry production in California is perhaps the most challenging soil environment that you can possibly imagine. Many of these soils are gray sands. They, have, they look like beach sand. And they have been fumigated every single year for the last 30 years. They are the ultimate definition of dead soil. There is more microbiology in most concrete than there is in the soils. <laughs> and 
These, in, these soils, they're gray sands, but they are so incredibly hard and so compacted that when they go through with a tiller, they use a rototiller to prepare the soil before making raised beds. When they go through the soils with a tiller, before doing the bed shaping and laying plastic mulch on raised beds, the soils look like a field of marbles. They're these, all these hard little chunks that have been cut into little round balls by the rototiller. They would make awesome slingshot ammunition. So we're working on these, and this, this is the soil environment that we're working with with strawberries. And our test plots, we have these raised beds of plastic mulch with drip irrigation tape underneath that are 500 feet long. And our test plots are a 100 foot section of a 500 foot long strip. And we have four of these. So obviously, we can't do anything with the drip irrigation system. We can't inject any nutrients or any biologicals through the drip irrigation system because that means the entire 500 foot row would get it. And we would lose our controls. So instead of using the drip irrigation system, we, at planting, we put in biologicals and biostimulants in the planting hole with a transplant drench. And then for the remainder of the growing season, we put on weekly foliar applications that were uh, biostimulants and nutrients that were designed to increase the plant's photosynthesis and to increase overall yield and quality as a result of increased photosynthesis. We were able to get some very favorable responses. We got very nice yield responses. We got very nice quality responses. But what really got my attention was at the end of the growing season, they peeled off the plastic and these soils I described as gray sands. When they pulled back the plastic, you could spot where the test plots were 500 feet away because it was black. It had changed from gray to black. In a single growing season, we didn't add any compost. We didn't add any humates. We didn't add any biochar. We didn't add any of the soil amendments. In fact, we added no soil amendments. So we didn't add any soil amendments that you would credit with changing the soil's organic matter content. When we conducted a soil analysis, we had gained a third of a percentage point of organic matter. 0.35% on the test plots versus the untreated soil. How does that happen? About the same time, it was a year later, we had the experience with the corn crop that I mentioned a moment ago, where we were building organic matter while growing corn successively year after year. How does that happen? What I realized is that what we have, after doing a lot of research and studying and trying to connect a lot of different dots, I eventually learned that what we have come to accept as being common and as being normal today is crops which are photosynthesizing at only about 20 to 25 percent of their inherent genetic capacity. So, and in some cases even less, some cases as low as 15 percent. So imagine what might happen when you move a plant's photosynthetic potential from 20% up to, let's say, 80%, you've just quadrupled the quantity of sugar that a plant can produce in every 24-hour photo period, which means that, theoretically, on some crops, on vegetative crops in particular, you could quadruple the yields. On reproductive crops, you're not going to quadruple the yields, but you, that this is where we're getting these tremendous yield increases on green beans and nectarines that I spoke about. It also means that on, on a corn crop, for example, when you quadruple the sugar production every day, does that mean you're going to get quadruple the yield? No, probably not. Are you going to get plants that are four times as big? No, probably not. So where does all the extra sugar go? All the extra sugar goes out through the root system as root exudates to feed soil biology. And uh, I've, I've worked through, I've developed a number, a couple of different mathematical models to understand how sugar is partitioned inside the plant. Do you know that with a really healthy corn crop, a healthy corn crop can transfer as much as 15,000 pounds of sugar out through the root system as root exudates to feed the soil biology in a single growing season. How much compost would you have to add to do to compare with that? Can you afford that much compost? Can you afford to put on that much molasses or biochar or humates? Not economically on a recurring basis. So this is one of the foundational ideas is that we can develop, so I became, in looking at all these different pieces, all of a sudden I became really inspired by the potential that I realized was possible with truly regenerative agriculture ecosystems. I realized that we could grow plants that were so healthy that they were completely resistant to diseases and insects, 
And secondly, they were able to transfer that immunity to the people who consume that food, and we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. And third, we can sequester enormous amounts of carbon and build soil organic matter and regenerate soil health very, very rapidly. That, to me, should be the standard of regenerative agriculture. Regenerate soil health, regenerate plant health, and regenerate human health. I believe that such regenerative agriculture ecosystems will become the standard. They'll become the status quo against which everything else is compared within the next two decades, globally. Why? Because those producers who adopt these regenerative agriculture principles immediately become the most profitable producers and they become the low cost producers. You achieve what you incentivize. And when you give growers a strong economic incentive to achieve high yielding crops and to be profitable, then it's almost a given that we will see adoption, to these regener adoption of these regenerative agriculture ecosystems. Do you think the green bean grower who produced 10 and a half tons per acre across his entire operation is going to be satisfied with 4.5 tons per acre ever again in the future? Probably not. And neither are all of his competitors. I realized that if we want to have a truly regenerative agriculture ecosystem become the mainstream globally, then we need to clearly describe that there is a strong profit opportunity here. We need to describe the economic potential. So within our work at Advancing Eco Agriculture for the last 10 years, we have focused very strongly on making certain that every time we begin working with a grower, we, we expect that when we make a recommendation, we want the grower to experience an economic response from that recommendation this year. This is an immediate response, not some futuristic expectation that we want to build soil health and use soil mineral, soil mineral amendments, et cetera, and we hope that we get an accumulating benefit where in three to five years from now we're able to measure it economically. That's not how we're going to change agriculture. If we want agriculture to change on a large scale, we need to be able to show very strong economic incentives very quickly. And because of that, I believe that we need to begin thinking, as farmers, as farm managers, we need to begin thinking differently about how we manage plants and how we manage crops. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching an intensive course here today. I know that some of you are there. But I would, um, I would strongly suggest that as farm managers, you need to begin thinking differently about the way you manage your farm ecosystem in one key, distinct way. Shift your perspective from being soil-centric to being plant-centric. That's it. Instead of constantly thinking about how to build and how to improve soil health, think about how you can accelerate plant health. Because as I described a bit earlier, once you begin growing really healthy plants and photosynthesizing really strongly, it's the healthy plants that create the healthy soil. You cannot economically afford to put on enough compost or grow enough cover crops to compete what a health, with what a really healthy crop can do. If you want to accelerate the entire cycle, we need to focus on plants rather than on soils. And not only is there this long-term benefit to focusing on plants, but there's also an immediate short-term benefit because when we begin focusing on plant health, that means that we begin producing healthy food that has a functional immune system and that can grow food as medicine immediately the first year. It's no longer a five-year goal. It can become an immediate goal. It can be something that we can achieve immediately. Ultimately, I believe that that should not, as farmers and as farm managers, that should not just be our desire. That is our purpose. Our purpose as farmers and food producers is to produce really healthy food. The reality is that uh, we, we know and understand very well that we have a disease epidemic in this country. We don't have a health epidemic. We have a disease epidemic. And we don't have a health care system either. We have a sick care system. Um, but this, this challenge of all these degenerative illnesses, degenerative diseases, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, autism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these, I believe, are not just problems of the food processing industry, although they certainly make a substantial contribution. They are also 
there is also a contribution and responsibility that we have as farmers. As farmers, as food producers, we can do more to keep people healthy than all the doctors and hospitals combined because we have the unique capacity to prevent people from becoming ill. Thank you. I believe that these models and these agriculture ecosystems will quickly become the status quo. I believe they will be rapidly adopted by the younger generation of farmers. And so the challenge that I have for you is if, if you believe that regenerative agriculture is just another new fad and you are being left behind, it's not necessary, not appropriate to talk about regenerative agriculture, that what we've been doing for the last 30 years is good enough, and I'm speaking specifically in this context to organic growers, to organic farmers. This may come as a shocker and as a surprise, but what we have observed, what I've observed working with thousands of farms all across the country, is that unfortunately, far too often, the growers who are, using, who are growing fruit and vegetable crops with conventional organics, using compost, using cover crops, using liquid fish, etc., are often producing the least nutrient-dense crops. It is not the way of the future. If you have diseases, Diseases and insects are nature's survival of the fittest mechanisms. They're here to take the unhealthy plants out of the system before we can consume them as food. It's a really dumb idea to then spray them with toxins and feed them to people. So if we have a lettuce crop or a broccoli crop that has flea beetles or that has aphids or that has cabbage looper, it's not fit for people to consume. It's not healthy enough. It's not going to boost our immune system. It is not food as medicine. The agriculture of the future will be growing plants that have that capacity, that have that level of resistance, and that are not being consumed by nature's survival of the fittest mechanisms, that are not being consumed by diseases and insects. And that will require a shift and a change from what has been true for historical organic agriculture production. We now need to go to the next level. We need to take it to the next step. And so I would, I would my challenge to you would be to understand deeply do the, do the homework, understand the science of the, what is needed, the nutrition management, the farm management that is needed to grow to crops to this level of plant health. And if you feel left behind and you don't want to adopt that level of innovation, then understand that that is a personal choice. That's not being imposed upon you by the system. The world is changing, it's changing very rapidly, it's changing very quickly, and you can either change and adapt with it or be left behind. The choice is entirely yours. I find it really intriguing that crops and farms, so when we look at soil and plant ecosystems and farm ecosystems, soils and plants are so intricately connected. Healthy soils help us sustain healthy plants. Healthy plants create healthy soils. So we have this momentum, this flywheel effect, where regenerative farming systems are a self-perpetuating system where healthy soils are producing lots of sugars, they're feeding soil biology, soil biology is extracting minerals and making them available to plants, and the, so the soil health is sustaining plants, the plants are sustaining soils, and this, it's, it's this constantly self-perpetuating cycle. It's a perpetual motion machine. Soils which are degrading in a degenerative cycle are also a self-perpetuating machine. When you have unhealthy plants that aren't photosynthesizing well, they're not producing sugars and sending sugars out to the root system as root exudates, you don't have good soil biology, which is not releasing minerals and making minerals available to plants, and thus the plants become even health unhealthier. So you can have a cycle in which soils and plants are constantly becoming unhealthier and unhealthier and unhealthier, or the opposite, in which health is constantly improving. The only difference between those two systems on any farm is the farm manager. That's you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark.